Um, what I'm really keen to talk about today is how GM crops can help support and already are supporting sustainable cropping systems around the world. And it's really good to be able to talk to this to an audience of people that's really concerned about looking at the bigger picture of things. Because typically the reaction of a lot of um, citizens in Australia is, what is it about GM crops for me? And uh, what I really want to emphasize is there are lots of things about the GM crops that are out there already that seem to meet lots of societal goals and there's more in the wings. So in terms of crop sustainability, the primary things I'm going to try to address today include the, that the current crops really focus on pest management. And in the course of doing so, they've reduced pesticide impacts and along the way have reduced fuel use, CO2 emissions, and erosion because a, a strong component of reducing pest management problems is reducing weed problems and uh, introducing weed management systems that could greatly reduce tillage. Um, along the way, they've also improved economics uh, sustainability and when um, the, Bob Shapiro at Monsanto some years ago started dreaming of these crops in the first place people have often said he didn't really think about the consumer interest but he did pretty clearly have a line on who he th who he saw as the primary consumers and that were was farmers and as I'll show you um, this technology is spread largely because of widespread uh, adoption by farmers because of these advantages the other thing I want to talk about is the crops in field trials currently have um, potential to have even greater environmental advantages than we've seen so far by reducing nitrogen pollution, particularly nitrous oxide, and improving uh, yields in the face of salinity and drought. The current transgenic crops are really based around um, three primary technologies, resistance to insects through Bacillus thuringiensis, herbicide resistance mostly to the herbicide glyphosate, but there are a few others that are out there as well. But um, a small and often overlooked aspect of the current GM crops is they also, some of them also use hybrid technology that give them greater weed competitiveness, as I'll talk about in a moment. And the other one, um, much underutilized at present to date, is virus resistance, um, which has a really important component from pest management perspective, because typically the only way we could control virus transmission in crops was to spray like mad to kill the insects that vector the diseases from one crop to the next. So this, this is actually a really important advance from a pest management standpoint and one that's still very much underutilized. I just want to talk about the virus resistant ones first. This is an example of the um, very first big success for virus resistance, um, which is on the Big Island of Hawaii, where virus resistant papaya was introduced after papaya ring spot virus arrived in Hawaii and was basically wiping out the papaya industry there. And I had the um, good fortune of being able to see this happen from both ends. The work was being driven by one of my colleagues um, at Cornell University, where I was at the time, Dennis Gonsalves. And because my brother lived in Hawaii on family vacations, I actually had a chance to see the project grow in the field and talk to Hawaiian papaya growers and ask what they thought about it. So this was from Dennis Gonsalves' first field trial. These are traditional non-transgenic papayas um, surrounding the transgenic cro uh, crop. And as you can see, after just two years of the field trial, the non-transgenic ones essentially are being killed by papaya ring spot virus. The transgenic ones survived. And it is, it's probably the first case in the world where a transgenic crop has saved an agricultural industry. In fact, one of the ironies of this system is it's actually been possible now to start growing organic papayas on the Big Island because the level of protection, because so much of the papayas are virus resistant, so the effect that it has on slowing virus transmission, it means people can now reintroduce non-transgenic papayas and grow them organically. I also want to talk on this issue of hybrid. Uh, we know that hybrids, many like classical production, say in hybrid corn, um, have great capacity to grow very competitively. But with advent of, of better understandings of how um, pollination processes work, it's possible to generate um, artificial male sterile lines and to use those to generate hybrids, some of which are in play already in canola. And this is a, a slide from Canada, but you can see um, earlier in the year, you would have been able to see the same thing in Victoria or Western Australia, where hybrid, hybrid um, canola lines have so much greater vigor, particularly in the early season, that you can make one herbicide application before the crop comes, really gets going out of the ground, and then it grows so quickly and the canopy closes off so quickly that you don't have to follow up with any her other herbicide applications. In contrast, in this case in Canada, the second herbicide application was missed because of adverse weather, and the crop was never really to able to outgrow the weed management. In a long-term perspective for weed management, one of the things we looked at in the Weeds Cooperative Research Center in the 90s and 2000s was that one, in the future we had to reduce our uh, dependence on herbicides and the crop competition was clearly going to be one of the major ways to do it. And this suggests a way of, of uh, bending uh, GM technology up to achieve that. 
And as I said earlier, the crops, the advantages of these crops to farmers are really the primary reason they spread at an, at an incredible rate. Since their first really widespread commercial introduction in 1996, the annual increase in GM crops around the world has been on the order of 10 to 13 percent. It's probably, arguably, the most widely, most rapidly adopted agricultural innovation in history in terms of the amount of land that it's covered. Now, uh, GM crops, the most recent estimates are actually up uh, well over 160 million hectares around the world, <coughs> grown by something like nearly 20 million farmers, most of whom are small landowners in China and India growing uh, insect-resistant cotton. Um, and the advantages for them have been enormous. Of particular interest is the fact that um, GM crops are being grown on a widespread scale in India and in Brazil before it was legal to do so in either country. The people had effectively bootlegged GM seed, farmers had seen the advantages, had bootlegged out GM seed and started growing it on, on fairly large areas before the countries involved actually approved it, long before it was promoted by anybody, which I think says something about the intrinsic features of the, that farmers see in these technologies. In terms of the farm benefits of transgenic crops, um, from a pest management standpoint, one of the from it, those of us working in pest management, one of the primary things is a reduction in persistent pesticide use, which has varied from 5 to 70 percent, depending on the crop. On a global basis, this has been a reduction, annual reduction in pesticide use of 350 million kilograms, which is roughly equal to 40 percent of the, of the total use of pesticides in the European Union. If you compare GM crops on average to non-GM crops, there's about a 16 percent reduction in pesticide use. And it tends to be high, the, the reason I emphasize persistent pesticides is it's eliminated the use of persistent pesticide, insecticides in cotton in many areas. And in the primary one has been herbicide use, where we've replaced a number of fairly persistent herbicides with dubious environmental and human health properties with um, the herbicide Roundup, or glyphosate, which is um, comparatively so safe, will let people buy it in the grocery store and take it home and spray it in their gardens. So it's replaced things that were um, worrisome with one of the safer pesticides we have available to us. On a global scale, there's been increased yield on the order of billions of kilograms and on the order of about $5 billion a year in cost savings. And a lot of these, this data have been generated by Jorge Fernandez Corneo of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, some of my, back in, even back in the 90s, um, some of my friends went to Argentina for the World Congress, um, World Wheat Congress. It was estimated in Argentina that the introduction of Roundup Ready soybeans had reduced the value of the Argentinian um, herbicide market by $300 million a year because relatively expensive herbicides that have been used in soybeans were replaced by relatively cheap glyphosate, most of it produced in China and off patent, greatly reducing costs. And indeed, this had a dramatic effect on the pesticide industry itself, where American Cyanabit, the, country, the company that had been producing these herbicides, basically went out of business because of competition with cheap glyphosate and Roundup Ready soybeans. And GM crops have benefited growers wherever they've been grown around the world in terms of increased yields, reduced inputs, increased net profits, or time saved. Many North American soybean farmers will tell you that the primary advantage they see of Roundup Ready soybeans is it saves them a lot of time in the summer with weed control, which allows them to pursue either off-farm income activities, or a couple have told me it means I can take time off in the summer to go watch my kids' ball games, where otherwise I couldn't have. It was a, it's a, actually an improvement in quality of lifestyle. In Australia, an example for comparison, particularly relevance to Australia, because we still have a state, or a state that doesn't allow people to grow GM canola, is that herbicide use is, in Canada has been, has been reduced by 11 percent. Um, there's been less fuel use. In, in 2005, it was estimated the net farm incomes had been increased by almost $200 million. And this isn't um, PR from flax at Monsanto or anything. This was done um, in a study by the European Commission's Joint Research Commission that went out, Joint Research Center, which went out and looked at all available data. 